Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jinghua Zhao, Professor of City Science and Transportation at MIT. Uh, welcome to the MIT Mobility Forum. Uh, this is hosted by the MIT Mobility Initiative. Today, we have a very special panel talking about micromobility and cities. Uh, Buwa Atluri actually designed the, the, the panel and invited a great panelist to join us to uh, uh, discuss this very interesting topic. Right Before I pass the forum to Buwa, I just reiterate, in this forum, uh, we encourage people to turn on your video so that we can see each other faces. So video on, audio off, right? Secondly, in this forum, also invite all participants to contribute one idea, either in the format of a question or answer and type it into the chat, right? That's the kind of the uh, a convention in the forum to so make it really dynamic and interactive, right? Without further ado, let me pass the forum to Buwa. Buwa, please. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Genoa. Uh, it's an absolute honor to be moderating such a distinguished panel with such varied representation uh, across the micromobility space. Uh, I have no doubt that this is going to be a, a fascinating discussion. Uh, to our audience, we will still have the audience Q&A for the last 15, 20 minutes. So don't worry, please drop your questions in the chat, your comments as we speak. Uh, we will try and limit our discussion to around 35, 40 minutes. Uh, to our panelists, like Jinwa mentioned, feel free to uh, show a slide or two showcasing an infographic, graph, or an any product picture. We would like to keep this more conversation-led and not PowerPoint-led. Uh, so yeah, so let me just uh, go ahead and introduce the panel in no particular order. Uh, let me start with uh, Yasha Franklin Hodge. Uh, so Yasha serves as the chief of streets, uh, where he oversees uh, Boston's uh, city's public works and transportation department. Uh, he He's, he supports the delivery of high quality essential city services and works with uh, to implement mayor's boost transportation priorities, including reliable, affordable transit services, safer street design in every neighborhood, and a connected network of low stress bicycle routes. Uh, he's also a core six computer science graduate from MIT. So happy to have you back. Uh, moving on to Dave. Uh, Dave completed his undergrad in AeroAstro at the University of Michigan and later did a master's uh, from AeroAstro here and I think also a, a, something at Sloan, was it a dual degree? Uh, uh, Dave has bikes running in his blood, uh, running the pioneering Montague bikes for a few decades now. Uh, check out their you know, patents on folding bikes and the likes. Uh, with his vast expertise, Dave is now targeting a new segment and different use case of shared micromobility, which uh, we shall get into quite soon. Uh, my next participant is uh, Mike. Mike has been with uh, Lyft and earlier Motivate for almost nine years, I think, and has played a pivotal role in growing bike share over the last decade in US cities. Uh, he is the director of product, data science, and software engineering for transit, bikes, and scooters. Let me know if I missed out anything, Mike. So basically anything non-car at Lyft, Mike is the, is the guy to go to. Uh, he's also worked for the New York MTA, uh, and he has a BS in computer science from Stanford and a master's in transportation right here uh, from MIT, where he worked with Nigel Wilson and also with uh, Genoa. And uh, lastly, uh, I'm, I'm moving on to Tony. Tony completed his bachelor's and master's in industrial and mechanical engineering from the University of uh, Manitoba and Toronto, respectively. Uh, he has an MBA from the Harvard Business School. Uh, we let that pass. <laughs> Tony has worked across many industries, including CPG, real estate, and has founded quite a few startups as well. Uh, he is currently the vice president for robotics and micro mobility business development at Segway Ninebot. And uh, I, I know when we think of Segway, we all think of Dean Kamen Segway, but let me tell you, this is quite different from uh, what we, we we all remember as Segway Ninebot. And uh, hopefully, we'll get into a bit of that in the in in, in this panel discussion. Uh, so just to establish context, I'm just going to share two quick slides. Uh, I am very aware that our audience is, you know, a very global audience. Uh, so just to set uh, some context, I hope you can see my full screen. Okay, yeah. Uh, so this is uh, a, a very rough classification of micro mobility from the International Transportation Forum. Uh, micro mobility basically is, you know, what we've been doing for years. You know, bicycles e-scooters, skateboards, it could be powered, it could be unpowered. Uh, I think the, the the demarcation between type AB and type CB is the top speed of 16 miles an hour, which is basically what you do when you're cycling a regular non-powered bike. Uh, so yeah, 
So, so the, the, the key thing of micro mobility is, is it's the same order of magnitude of weight as the person it's carrying, right? So you're using like a 20 kilo cycle to carry a 50 kilo human being and, and, and it's not, you're not using a 5,000 pound car, EV or not, to transport somebody. So uh, it, there's increasing clamor among the urban planning community to call this right size mobility and not micro mobility because this is the right size and cars are sort of oversized mobility. But um, anyway, so this is just to set some context on what we will be discussing the different modes, what we mean when we say micro mobility, it could be powered, it could be non powered and you know, it, it's really lightweight. So it's like, it could be 10, 20, 30 kilos and you know, for like golf carts and all slightly heavier at 200, 300 kilos. Uh, and uh, this is, I mean, this is not a plug for Lyft uh, in any way, but uh, Lyft recently shared this multimodal report. And uh, I, I wanted to set context with this because 50% uh, uh, of uh, car trips in the US are less than three miles. Uh, uh, that's, that's less than five kilometers. And uh, most of these are single occupancy car trips. And these are, this, this is just ripe to be replaced by more efficient micromobility modes. And we have seen this been happening, you know, thanks to bike share that has grown handsomely over the last decade. And this works, you know, like if you see the numbers uh, that people who regularly use bike share, who have access to good bike lanes, infrastructure, good availability of these shared bike systems, like, you know, New York City, Boston, Chicago, uh, they are ditching their cars and they're not getting new ones. So that, that results in a lot of saved CO2. And a half of them, or half of the shared micromobility riders do not even own or lease a personal vehicle. So this is, I, I think this is, this shows that this system can work, you know, if we put in uh, the, the, the uh, uh, in, uh, enough effort into it. Uh, so that, that was just to set some context. Uh, this report is available on Lyft's website. They've also shared, you know, the methodology of how they conducted the survey. So I encourage y'all to uh, go through it. And, you know, you can always ask Mike a question or two since uh, his, he, he, his team uh, was part of this report. Anyway, so let me start with uh, the question here. Uh, so I've introduced yourself, but please feel free to add a line or two about yourself when you first speak. Uh, but I uh, while I've mentioned, you know, the great advantages that micromobility has in reducing greenhouse gas emissions, it comes with a lot of challenges. Our infrastructure has primarily been built for cars over the last few decades, and you know this does not merge well with micro mobility. The speed and weight differential is just too much, and you know that always causes issues. Uh, we need protected lanes. We need speed segregation. Is it too late? You know because we have limited real estate. Our area has been built up. Uh, you know cities like Paris have banned rented e-scooters. Schools have banned e-scooters for other reasons, you know, the battery uh, issues. So there's a lot of flux in the sector, which has caused, uh, you know, VCs to back out. Uh, companies have seen valuation plummet. Uh, multiple e-bike manufacturers such as VanMove have declared bankruptcy. So, you know, it's we are in sort of a flux. We see the positive aspects of micromobility, but it's not the easiest thing to implement at a, on a large scale. Uh, so let me start off by turning it to Mike. Uh, Mike, you know, you've been at Motivate Lyft for over like, close to 10 years, uh, you know, really growing bike share for fleets and cities. So how, what, you know, what were the challenges that you faced when you started 10 years ago? We take bike share for granted now in many cities. Uh, you know, what are the challenges you faced then? And, you know, are you seeing similar challenges in few cities right now? And how could we even address some of these challenges? Yeah. Well, one thing I can say is when I started doing that, I did not have any of this gray hair. Um, and so some of that comes with age. Some of that comes with a lot of hard work and stress and blood and anguish and tears and all those things. Um, do you want me to address that question directly first, move on? I'll go through a little bit of just my like quick intro slides. Yep. Um, go through your intro slides and then the question. That's perfectly fine. Okay. okay, cool. Just remind me if I forget to come back to the question. Yeah. Uh, so here is my just like very quick intro kind of where we are. Um, so what I do at Lyft is help lead the organization that does bike scooters and transit information within Lyft as a company. Our mission within the part of Lyft is to provide micro mobility solutions that riders love and cities need. And we do that by providing sustainable transportation infrastructure that we believe is like deeply integrated into the urban fabric in the cities uh, where the service is provided. Uh, noting that um, 
we are both like an operator as well as a kind of supplier to other cities and operators of micromobility hardware and software. If you combine kind of that footprint together, we have a pretty global impact at this point, supporting, I don't know, getting on to 200,000 vehicles around the world. You can see all the numbers here. I'm sort of shocked at how big this is compared to when I started working on this nine years ago, um, at least in terms of like the proportion of it that we kind of help influence and bring to life. Um, so this slide presents like a little bit of a history here, and perhaps it sort of answers your question, move on. But I mean, I got involved in, uh, let's see, here when it says Motivate was, Alta was acquired by and rebranded in 2014 to Motivate is when I joined this industry. Prior to that was sort of the initial creation of like the docked bike share system that we're familiar with in uh, North American and many European cities. And so sort of subsequent to that has been a combination really of like both product and technology development, like expansion across the country and the world, as well as, you know, I don't know, corporate transactions to help scale the business, bring investment into it and bring different parts of it together. So I won't like talk through the, the detailed history here. You can sort of see on the side, I could take questions later. Probably some people are familiar. This chart just shows the number of rides, uh, basically sort of rolling 12 months per year that for the systems where we operate, the number of rides per year in 2018 when Lyft took over Motivate. So if you go back to when I joined Motivate, maybe here. Uh, and now looking at the, kind of the end of this purple graph, that's the number of rides in the last 365 days as of you know when this slide was made pretty recently. So we've obviously seen like a very large expansion in you know the fleets, the equipment, and, and the ridership. My role in this has really been on the product and technology side of things, working very closely with the people who operate on the street, the people who work to set up our agreements with cities to sell all over the world. Um, and so, you know, we've been kind of really iterating and investing heavily. And I really don't use the word innovation. So I'll just say improving on both the hardware and the software side of this. I think, you know, to some extent, the business starts with hardware. You can't provide this kind of service on street without stations, bikes, scooters, et cetera. But I really feel like it kind of finished, let's say finishes with software because once you put the hardware into service, you know, your levers to keep improving it, however you define improving, are primarily about, at least from a technology perspective, primarily about software. Once the hardware is made, sure, like if a component's failing, you can improve it and when you maintain it, you know, put in a new version of that component, but you can't just buy all new bikes, buy all new stations. So over time, like the continued sort of improvement you get to the system, once you have the hardware is really going to be driven by software uh, from a technology perspective. So yeah. sort of summary of, you know, kind of like what I've yeah. been spending my time in. So very high level there. I'm happy to go into any details that people want. In terms of the question of like, what was the state of things nine years ago when I started doing this versus today? Um, and this is taking a very kind of North American perspective here, because obviously there was bike share and micro mobility in you know, Europe and France before this. But I would say effectively when I joined, like there was just the technology solutions were not stable. There weren't kind of reliable products, hardware and software you could use to just deploy and operate a system. Uh, and that's sort of my narrow perspective here. Um, and, but I do think that like at that point in time when I started the perspective on like the right sort of operating model and collaboration model with cities was actually sort of in place. And I think over the last nine years, the technology solutions and the product solutions have very much stabilized and started to dramatically improve with new types of vehicles, new types of stations, software and everything. Um, but the question of like the relationship with cities and what competition should look like, and you know, that has kind of gone through many cycles around permits, competitive, doc, dockless, et cetera. And I, you know, and I guess um, throughout all of that, my perspectives haven't changed too much, uh, but you know, maybe that's what we're here to debate today. 
Thank, thank you, Mike. I think I think John uh, summarized this quite aptly in his 10 trends presentation. It's moved from competition from the market to competition for the market. You know, it's uh, that's you know we look. But in, in twenty in twenty in two thousand and fourteen when I started, it was it was old school competition for the market. So we've kind of yeah. going through a cycle. Gone, yeah. gone full circle. Yeah. And uh, so, so Professor Dan uh, threw in from the Sloan School actually has a mobility forum on optimizing city bike placements. So I would tell our request our audience if they're more interested to go check that out. Uh, let me move on to Dave. Uh, so Dave, you're the you know founder of Metro uh, Mobility as well as the Park and Federal Program uh, right here in Massachusetts. Uh, so as, as I understand it, you're addressing a slightly different market segment. You know, not the core cities over here. So, so what is Park and pedal, and uh, you know how did that lead to your to development of your charging stations? You know the charge lock uh, pattern that you have. You know if you could talk and maybe sh show a slide or two on this. Thank you. Sure, sure. Thanks, Bhuvan. So, um, I, I think you know Lyft and 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 others do a, a fantastic job um, providing uh, micro mobility services to um, urban um, residents. Um, but what Park and Pedal is, um, is a little different. It's a free program um, that we developed with the, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, it's a multimodal commuter program um, that tries to get people out of their cars and onto bicycles. So it's park and ride except um, bicycles instead of buses and trains. Um, so the average American lives about 18 miles from the office, but the average American doesn't want to ride a bicycle 18 miles. Um, so um, our surveys really show that, that the average American wants to ride sort of three to five miles uh, as part of their daily commute. Um, so um, Park and Pedal really provides a gateway to um, commuting um, for the, the vast majority of Americans who are um, driving into, uh, into work every day. And let me just share, uh, can you guys see that okay? Yep, all good. Okay. So uh, according to the, the US Census inflow and outflow uh, data for the top 25 US cities, and I apologize, uh, like Mike, I'm um, US focused on this, um, but 32% uh, of people live and work in the city while is 68% commute into or out of the city on a daily basis. And so um, micro mobility does a great job for those 32%. Um, but 68% of the people, you know, coming in, bringing their big cars and SUVs into the city, um, it really, um, there ought to be another way. And so what Park and Pedal does is it tries to focus on, um, uh, on, on that group. Um, the environmental benefits of Park and Pedal uh, really are shown in this chart. The uh, y-axis is CO2 emissions in grams per mile. Um, and the x-axis is a little bit odd. It's um, average speed of a car with the higher speeds on the left and the lower speeds on the right. Um, so as a car, a, a traditional car is going really fast, it's not particularly um, uh, efficient, um, but it has a sweet spot in the middle. But as it gets into urban congestion um, and it's stop and go traffic, um, the uh, emissions go way up. And so the goal um, that we set out to do was basically let's um, you know have the right size vehicle for the segment of the trip that you're on. So um, if you're out in the suburbs and you're cruising along on the highway, um, a car is fairly efficient. Um, but when you get into stop and go traffic and, and urban congestion, um, a car really is 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 what you call it mega mega mobility. Mike, I think you said um, is uh, is it's just overkill. Um, and so um, light electric vehicles really make a lot more sense there. Um, so Park and Pedal really tries to provide a convenient way to drive partway, park your car for free, and then cycle the rest of the way to work, um, you, know, of, you know, avoiding last mile traffic and uh, parking issues in the city. Um, so um, great program, rave reviews about it. The only problem was um, that um, there was a, a lot of uh, griping about BYOB, bring your own bicycle on your car. That's fine a couple of days, but every day of the week, schlepping your bike on your car really um, was, was problematic. Um, so, um, so we realized that we needed to provide some kind of mobility at the charge lock state, at the uh, park and pedal stations or locations. Um, so we developed um, a, a charging and locking station called charge lock 
that offers grab and go e-bikes and scooters um, to commuters who don't want to schlep their own bikes. Uh, so charge lock stations um, sort of offer a great user experience. They're very simple, very, um, and therefore um, very inexpensive, about a fifth or, or, or less the cost of comparable charging stations currently available. Um, and we've installed about a 60 um, docks of these stations um, around the Boston area, some servicing housing authorities, um, one at Mass General Hospital. Uh, we just installed last week for uh, Mass General uh, Hospital workers. Um, and because they're so exp inexpensive, um, the pricing to users can be um, very low. So we're excited and I think others are excited about uh, our new tech, um, we're offering it not just, we're really not an operator. Um, we l let um, others do that um, who are much better at it than us. Um, and we're offering uh, our new tech uh, and park and pedal to uh, everybody to, uh, to, to use. Thanks, thanks, Dave. And I think, you know, one of the features of this is you could, you, you could go to the shops and use the cable to just lock your bike while you're shopping inside. So, you know, quite a nifty feature that one. Uh, talking about product features, Tony, I'm going to move to you next. Uh, you've been in this space for a while. Uh, you have a great view of what's happening in Asia and the US and North America. Uh, so, you know, from like a couple of years ago to, you know, the rapid uh, growth in e-bikes, e-scooters. Uh, so, so what are some of the trends that uh, you are seeing? And also currently on the manufacturing and supply chain challenges, especially, uh, you know, importing products into the US, maybe, you know, batteries, materials of Chinese origins. We have seen issues in the electric vehicle space. Uh, are there any issues that you foresee in the electric bike space, you know, in importing these materials uh, from uh, China to the US? You know, the, the geopolitics, like we say, of the whole mobility okay. sector. That, that, that's actually a very loaded, loaded question. <laughs> uh, maybe, uh, maybe a little bit about us. Um, I, 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 uh, I don't have a slide. Uh, uh, try to stay informal, in maybe a conversation. So feel free to ask That's me. Totally fine. Totally fine. Later on, uh, and so so uh, Segway was uh, essentially merged with Nibot back in 2015. So uh, the original vision of uh, Dean Kamen, who invented the Segway, was still there. We are trying to solve the urban transportation problem, uh, congestions and pollution, and whatnot, and and using. Uh, so well, now it's called micro mobility vehicles, but that time was actually called a scooter. <laughs> In fact, actually, Dean actually didn't like the name scooters because he thought Segway is sort of a special invention and it needs to have a special name. So we call them uh, personal transportation, like Segway PT. Um, but uh, people like to call them scooter anyway. <laughs> so, so what ended up happening is uh, they, they just want to call uh, that form factor they look familiar. familiar. So, so, so the the new Segway is actually uh, quite practical in the sense that uh, we started as a essentially a, a self balancing vehicle companies and and mostly making uh, the mall cop, the the security guard, and all the Segway tours vehicles specialized, but also very expensive. Um, but we pivoted uh, to the essentially the the consumer uh, electric kick scooter space, and we're sort of fortunate in, at the time that uh, micro mobility is just taking off. So. Um, so uh, fast forward to today, uh, we we are, uh, especially in the kick scooter space, we are the largest player in that space. Uh, so benefit quite a bit from the, the micro mobility boom back in the 2017, 18. I can't believe it, it was especially very short time, five or six years, but I felt like I'm very old in this whole industry. Uh, I guess age-wise, I'm also old, but the... <laughs> We are truly a veteran. This actually whole group, uh, even just the past the three or four years, a lot has changed. So, uh, so we actually do have a lot of story to share. Uh, probably, what's, I can spend hours talking about this. Uh, but uh, um, after the the sort of the boom and bust of the whole uh, the initial scooter sharing craze, uh, one general trend is I think the industry is going to a, a more uh, rational state. Um, and also, the, we we see a lot of the the VC has come and left, right? And also, a lot of the sort of the uh, high flying companies also uh, essentially had the same trajectory, almost like very kind of uh, uh, mirroring all the sort of the Gartner curve that you know we're going to sort of 
uh, uh, now in, in the stage that you know after the crash we kind of going to a slow slow uh, uh, ramp up later on, but eventually it will become a more uh, a mass of mass mass adoption. But I, I think uh, there's certain things we are originally maybe a few, a few years ago we kind of predicted is really happening right now. So so for example. You know, obviously, we all the industry, the, the whole industry is actually consolidating. So uh, you 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 only see a few big players left, right? And then there's small guys here, local guys here and there, but they are consolidating. Uh, and two is that we actually see from product manufacturer point of view, uh, we see a total specialization of a lot of things and people competing on at the sort of uh, uh, your core competence level, not not just purely you can make the product. So back in 2017 or 18, we, we actually had a very easy time where uh, as long as you can make, you know, I still remember back then we had the only factory that can, we we actually had our own factories making scooters, but the only factory that can make 100,000 units a, a, a year. And we happened to have people knocking on our doors with cash waving in front of you, hey, you know, whatever you, capacity would take it right but this is sort of completely you know the old stuff the, the back in the 2017 18 days um now is everybody's going back to very no, sort of normal way of doing business right so so now we're competing at a different level in in terms of um not just the the vehicle itself but also the uh, uh as, as uh, uh michael from lyft mentioned that you know we are actually working with lyft on on our computer vision like robotics scooters that detect sidewalks to help regulators yeah. to do a better job uh with, with david we're actually doing uh, integration with their charge lock as well to essentially enhance enhance our uh, uh product capabilities and also putting more technology into that to to make the essentially lower uh lower the cost of total uh, ownership or total cost of ownership and a lower cost, uh, essentially the operating and in, in, including efficiencies for the, for the fleet. So in some way, we can say that uh, and it, it almost mimicking pretty much all the other transportation sectors. Um, the the product company will will focus on product and also they're making their product better. Um, and then the operating company is focusing on their core business as well. So essentially, the the Airbus. Boeing story versus the, the the United Airlines and the other airliners. Uh, so uh, so in some way we we definitely see some some specialization and also um, there's a, a a huge advantage in terms of having the scale. So for example, um, to, uh, last year uh, January, so we we accumulatively made over, or shipped over ten million kick scooters. Um, and this is sort of uh, 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 still continuous growing. And this year we'll probably see e-bike demand growing as well. So uh, in, so, in some way that uh, you know the, the, the company who can uh, have the scale and it still commands a huge advantage in, in this in terms of coming up with new technology and also reducing the cost and whatnot. Uh, and especially when it comes to hardware, uh, like they said, hardware actually is hard <laughs> to make. So you you do need a lot of things uh, lined up to to make a, a, a essentially a, a profitable business. Um, so uh, all said, it's not all, uh, all 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 gloom and doom uh, in the micro mo mobility industry. Perhaps on the sharing side, there's actually you know we're going so through through a roller coaster ride. But I think uh, what's what's really promising to us is that. Uh, uh, we actually uh, invested early on to um, to invest in this, essentially the consumer space uh, since day one. So, so even when we are sharing business growing like crazy, we didn't uh, uh, we didn't lost focus on our consumer products. So that's why uh, what you see now is the the market is actually being educated by, in fact, in fact by the sharing fleet because they are on the street. Everybody see them every day. And you actually have a experience riding on those scooters or e-bikes, and then you say, "Hey, you know, maybe I should buy one for myself." So, so we are seeing on the consumer side is the ownership of micro mobility device is actually really taking off, especially with the the fact that uh, uh, COVID is almost like a catalyst to this because you know people have cash in their in their hands, and then they actually end up, end up buying uh, scooters and um, and 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 e-bikes. But so 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 we're seeing some uh, still steady growth on the uh, owner owned vehicle side, um, and uh, we really have high hope in this because all the infrastructure is also changing. 
so it's a really encouraging uh, consumer to own their own, own vehicles. Uh, different geographic area probably have different uh, character characteristics. Um, but in general, people start to realize that the benefit of the, the micro mobility vehicles. Um, so, so we are very, very optimistic in terms of the, the, the future of this, especially when you introduce actually even more, more sort of smart features and more safety features. Uh, it will basically entice people to get out of their car and, and essentially get rid of their car and, and take the, the, the light electric vehicles instead. Uh, so there's still a lot of uh, opportunity ahead of us. And in fact, I, I, I've been telling a lot of people that uh, our, if you, even if you look at what we see today, only a very small, tiny fraction of the demographics are using light electric vehicles. So my personal belief is that the, the optimal form factor or the best vehicles for micromobility hasn't been invented yet. So, so it's actually a really a call to pretty much everybody that it, potentially there's somebody come up with even the uh, sort of the, even more the iPhone moment, right? So then, you know, you can have, you know, most of the people go out. The first thing you think about is not getting in a car. It's actually getting into a, a, a two wheel, three wheel, maybe even a light four wheel vehicle. So that's sort of our overall vision. Um, so maybe, maybe just one minute on the supply side. I, I, it's, it's, in fact, we're actually seeing some really good trend these days. And well, I guess you, you you all know Xi Jinping is in San Francisco right now. Uh, so we're seeing some kind of uh, warming up in terms of you know making sure the supply chain is getting uh, more efficient, uh, less trade war, but more more uh, leveraging each other's strengths. Uh, and also, in some way, the uh, uh, the scooters and the sort of the micro mobility industry. Uh, they are not rocket science. So, so it, 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 it usually doesn't pose any sort of political, geopolitical risk. Uh, even when it comes to, like, say, battery technology, we only use a fraction of the battery cells <laughs> compared to a car. So, so, so we, I, we actually don't see as much as um, sort, of a, sort of political tension in, in, in that sense. Uh, the only thing maybe a little bit in the past was the, 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 the tariff uh, when... Uh, when, when we had the trade war, uh, there's a little bit of tariff on that. But even that, the, a lot of some of the tariff is on hold until the end of this year for, for scooters. So I, I think uh, we, put, we have a pretty high hope that uh, hopefully this whole global trade trend can, can keep. So, so we'll keep the, the price of micro mobility vehicles or you know, the service uh, cheap enough so, so it can really disrupt cars. Yeah, um, no, that, that's, yeah, that, yeah, that's great. You know, I think your instead of leaving home when you go grab the car keys the whole mindset should move to you know just grabbing your micro mobility device and uh, and your your point is like excellent because uh, the 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 battery wars don't really impact us because the amount of cells that you use is so less that and that is basically how efficient a micro mobility device is uh, talking of loaded questions let me move to you yasha <laughs> uh, working with the you know city of boston uh, you know, we have examples like Paris banning shared e-scooters, uh, you know, a few Boston colleges uh, banning scooters because of, you know, safety concerns with the battery. Uh, how, so how, what, how, how, I mean, being the chief of streets, what is the best way to manage this precious limited street space that we have? You know, are there any studies or pilots being conducted at your end to figure out, you know, what is the optimal mix of, you know, uh, area for bike lane versus area for a car versus, uh, you know, area for deliveries or, uh, you know, how do we make sure that infrastructure is adapted for different vehicles, uh, different speeds? And um, yeah, just just curious to hear your thoughts, how you go about thinking about this. And, you know, hopefully this can lead to further discussion between the other panelists as well. Thank you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, thank you very much. And I appreciate everyone's uh, comments so far. Um, so, uh, you know, I think we've heard sort of in the questions and some of the answers, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, kind of ups and downs in this industry over the last few years. And, um, you know, but I think we try to keep our focus less on the, the surface and the waves on that surface and more in the, the deep ocean uh, and uh, a, a, an ocean that we think is rising in a good way in the sense that we are seeing more interest in and use of various types of micromobility in the city. And that has been a very consistent trend where use of bicycles has grown year over year, use of our uh, shared uh, 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 bike, uh, our bike share system has grown year over year, 
uh, use of uh, privately owned micro mobility vehicles of all stripes, um, from electric unicycles to stand up scooters to e bikes, has been growing as well. And so I think for us, we try to not get too lost in the, the waves and instead think about what are the more fundamental investments and changes that we can make uh, in our programs and in our infrastructure that will actually keep that. Uh, that 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 ocean rising and more people making the choice to do more of their trips by uh, whatever form of micro mobility vehicle they choose. Um, one of the big things that we're focused on is our bike share system. Um, we, uh, for a variety of uh, quirky state legal reasons that I won't uh, bore you all with the details of, um, stand up scooters have are are widely considered to be illegal in the state of Massachusetts. There's some debate about that, but the result has been that the shared, we kind of missed the 2018, 2019 wave of um, hyper competition around uh, shared scooters. And so the city has remained and our surrounding municipalities has remained very focused on our bike share system. And we, the way we think about bike share in Boston is that it is a form of public transportation. And when we say that, what we mean is that it needs to be affordable, it needs to be available, it needs to be reliable. We think about it as something that people can and we know do rely on for their daily transportation as well as for um, you know more occasional journeys. And we run it with those goals in mind. And that means a few things. It means we focus a lot on making sure that the system is widely available across the city and our surrounding communities, uh, that it reaches places that no profit-making business would in their right mind choose to go as an early action, but because we know that there are people there who need to get somewhere. And so we are going to subsidize that service to make sure that it can be where people need it. We've done a lot of work around affordability, looking at low income programs, looking at how the system itself is funded. There's a lot of various forms of public subsidy from the uh, state and city level uh, that have come in as well as the city has directed a lot of private subsidy. Um, we get developers to put in bike share stations and buy bikes and build in some cases, physical infrastructure to host those stations. Uh, so we do a lot of things using the various levers under our control to really try to make sure that this system is is truly a universal system that can complement our traditional form of public forms of public transit. And we see quite a few folks who do multimodal journeys that include our bike share system as well as uh, a bus or a train. Um, we are uh, one of the last cities, uh, last major bike share systems in the US to launch e-bikes, but we are about to do that very soon. Uh, thank you, Mike and team who have been hard at work at uh, helping us uh, get that off the ground. Um, but part of why we have waited to do this is because we did want to focus on affordability for e-bikes. And what we've seen in some of the other systems where there is not a robust care given to this is you end up with e-bike pricing that can sometimes be more expensive than hopping in an Uber or a Lyft and thus creating some very um, uh, problematic uh, financial incentives. So we're really trying to focus on keeping the permanent pricing down, making sure that our low-income riders can still have access to this, that we're not creating a two-tiered system. The other big area of investment for us, though, when we think about growing use of micromobility in the system is simply infrastructure, right? In We know that we need for people to feel safe when they ride a bike, a scooter, a unicycle, whatever it may be on our streets. And that means growing the amount of space that we set aside. To answer your question, Bhuvan, there's no formula, right? Like nobody, and nobody has one. The formula is, uh, you know, what is politically feasible? And what can we build support for to, um, you know, to create a, a bicycle network? What we are focused on though is the need for a connected network. I think, you know, while the politics of bike lanes are a reality, too often, at least in Boston, and I think this is true in many cities, there's been this emphasis on, uh, well, where is it easy? Like, where, where, where do we have so much space that nobody's going to complain if we put a bike lane there? And that was like a little, the low-hanging fruit. That's mostly picked. And what that has resulted in in Boston is we have a lot of lanes that don't connect uh, to the other lanes because the part that really needs the link is the hard one. You've got to take away some parking or do something else that motorists don't like. So we're really trying to focus our political capital on closing those gaps in the network. Um, in doing so, I think what we're seeing is one, a general rise in usage, uh, a rise as the percentage of vehicles on many streets. We're also seeing new categories of users. So 
Uh, I have a two and a half and a four and a half year old, and I drop my four and a half year old off at a Boston public school every morning. And in the mornings, it's like this convergence of cargo bikes and scooters and, you know, parents with your kids in the trailer, right? That didn't, that five years ago, that wasn't a thing, right? It was a rarity. Now it is a norm in our culture, right? And that is in part because parents feel safer with the infrastructure that we are building that they can ride with their kids. We're seeing older adults and people with disabilities are starting to embrace e-bikes as an option where traditional biking maybe wasn't available to them. We're working on how we can subsidize that for those particular population groups. So ultimately, it is about making sure that, um, you know, we're we're building out that public transit micromobility mentality and building the infrastructure so that whether it's owned or shared, that people know that they can make the trip they want to make safely uh, on a smaller device. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much for that. Uh, I think we'll. I think the chat has been hyperactive. Uh, John, I don't envy your job today of uh, coll collating the questions. Uh, probably we should probably move to the audience questions now, given that we have around 15 minutes left. Yeah, absolutely move on. It, it has been a very, very active chat. There's actually quite a lot of interesting commentary in the chat as well. So we will share that with all of you guys. There's uh, there's some good stuff in there. Um, but maybe just to start out, um, let me start with the topic of uh, safety. So uh, Brad Denny noted that in the United States, injuries associated with all micromobility devices increased nearly 21% in 2022 from 2021 and likely will increase this year. What is being done to improve micromobility user safety? Um, and so just any uh, reactions or reflections on the, the safety question? And maybe just a, a footnote here, there's almost, there's the safety that we think of in terms of collisions with pedestrians, with vehicles and so forth. And then there's another kind of safety issue related to battery fires. So you can feel free to tackle both of those. Uh, Tony, if you want to talk about the battery fires or, you know. Yeah, so, mentioned... so battery fire, uh, it's it's actually uh, uh, interesting to, to see the, the first few scooter batteries early on uh, was actually caused by um, the uh, in, in this case, for example, uh, the the first few uh, ten thousands of uh, uh, lime lime scooters are actually Segway scooters, but then in basically um, they, they were using the consumer version of the scooters and and try to you know almost a rig it, it to a commercial basis, yeah. adding adding LTS for so so that's actually a lot of fire was caused by those things. So so one of the things the it's it's actually the the produce the vendors. Uh, uh, job or liabilities essentially to make the product safe enough for for the commercial environment. So that's the sort of, sort of thing. The first thing we did in the early days, making sure all the batteries are UR certified, and also the the build of the vehicles, especially for commercial purpose, they need to be specialized designed. Um, so that's why we pretty much scrap uh, scrap the early design of the uh, consumer version. So 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 the the company who uh, who produce the product needs to be extremely careful. And also from regulator point of view, you know, it's actually a good thing. We, we actually welcome the, the regulator regulating body to impose on, on some of the, uh, the vehicle manufacturers. So for example, one of the e-bikes uh, we work together with Metro Mobility, that was the only UR certified, UR certified vehicles and also batteries included. So we, as a as an industry, probably need to urge the the cities and essentially the government to really mandating uh, these regulations. Um, and uh, so 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 from a product point of view, I think our job is also to maintain a quality standard, making sure every unit come out the same, service and all these things included. Uh, and and may, I'm sure Lyft can talk a lot about the, the sidewalk detections and those things for their safety. Um, application and which we actually work, we collaborate together too um, um but i think from a uh, technology point of view uh that's one of the things we think that's how we can differentiate ourselves from all the all the other uh, uh com competitors only thing yeah. i would add i mean the scooters we buy from tony the bikes we much more design and source and manufacture ourselves including batteries take battery safety extremely seriously, all the certifications. 
So he's mentioned as well as like extremely intense, like reliability testing, if it drops or, you know, beat up in the bike, et cetera. The only thing I would add on top of it is that safety is not just a question of like how a safety at the fleet level is not just a question of how a product is designed. It's also a question of how a product is operated and making sure that you have like safety mindset and safety procedures uh, built into the entire life cycle of the physical asset, how we, you know, move the batteries around, how we charge them, um, all the sensors on the battery in the bike to make sure that when there's anything that like, you know, requires the battery to be inspected, it's being inspected. The, the new charging cabinets we have for batteries do test like many, many things about the batteries to make sure that they're still in good condition. So it is, it is a life cycle kind of mindset. It's not just like buy the thing and believe it will be perfect forever. Joshua, do you have anything to add just in terms of the the other dimension of safety, which is, you know, how do you operate in a complex environment with mixed speeds? Yeah, um, separated space is a short answer. Um, but I, I mean, I think that's really our focus is creating places that are safe for the different types of speeds to operate. I do think there's a, some unanswered questions right now. I, you know, I, I appreciated the classifications that were shown at the outset of different types of micromobility vehicles. But I, I actually think that they're, they're somewhat arbitrary and not necessarily reflective of what's actually on the market and being used in the US, right? This 16 mile an hour, um, that is not a category of e-bike or e-scooter that is widely sold in the US. And so um, what we see, right, is there is a, you know, we, we tend to think of it more as like 20 miles an hour and under, uh, for vehicle-based travel, uh, you know, pedestrians are, you know, and those are two separate categories that need their own space and then 20 and above. Now we could find ourselves in some future world where we need the, you know, the class three e-bike lane in addition to the regular bike lane. But I think, you know, that's a, that's a success problem. If we're sort of trying to, you know, add yet another category of lane, I think right now for us, it's really to say, um, you know, how do we how do we have those three classifications and more broadly, right, there's a whole series of very well understood intersection changes that can reduce conflict that um, or design changes that can reduce conflict. We're trying to put speed humps on every single residential street in the city of Boston. That's about 380 miles of street. We're not going to put a bike lane on every one of those streets. But if cars are traveling 20 miles an hour or under on those streets, it makes it a lot safer for everybody who's walking, everyone who's biking, even without separated infrastructure. So there are things like that. And then of course, the whole catalog of design tools at intersections for visibility, for conflict reduction, for signal timing that can go in to help ensure that everybody stays safe. So um, we're trying to do this in building the dedicated lanes and retrofitting the rest of the infrastructure to lower the risk of injury and death. It, it, maybe just a super quick follow-up, Joshua. What about sidewalks? I mean, is it just a general rule for the city of Boston that sidewalks are for pedestrians? I, I sigh because this has been a topic of a lot of discussion lately. And it's actually very, our state laws are very antiquated. They don't acknowledge the existence of wide categories of uh, vehicles. We are, I think, the 47th state in the country to acknowledge in our laws that e-bikes exist. Um, and uh, e-scooters, electric unicycles, these things are just like undefined. And so there's a ton of gray area. Generally, the way the law is structured for bicycles says that they can be ridden on sidewalks when, uh, in, when outside of a major business district. Uh, when necessary for safety, but that people riding these devices have to yield to pedestrians and operate in a safe manner. Our position is generally that, uh, you know, things that move at higher speeds should not be on the sidewalk with pedestrians, that it is, especially in pedestrian dense environments, it is unsafe and it creates a lot of conflict. And, and in some ways, even more importantly, it actually creates a lot of ill will towards bikes and e-scooters, which then paradoxically makes it harder for us to build bike lanes 
because people are like these bikes they're terrible they're on the sidewalk they're almost run me down you know it's just it's like um there's there's a kind of very uh, unfortunate cycle that happens there so we encourage people to not ride their devices on the sidewalk um in some cases it is illegal in some cases it's gray uh in some cases it is allowed and i will say you know what at the end of the day we do understand that people need to keep themselves safe and i will occasionally ride my bike on a sidewalk when it is safe to do so if i know that that's the thing that's going to keep me out of harm's way so uh until we get to a state where our infrastructure is better designed for micro mobility there's a little bit of um you know just treat each other as human beings and recognize that even 12 miles an hour on a bike zipping past a person who's walking can be very scary uh and people need to operate all their vehicles with respect excellent so speaking of sidewalks, I'd like to turn to Andres Sevstek. So Andres is on the faculty at MIT. He's done a lot of work about thinking about the experience of moving on sidewalks. And Andres, you posed a very interesting question. I wonder if you could just share it with the group. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, yeah. There you are. Hey. Thank you. Yes, I was uh, um, on auto mute, so it seems to be working. Thanks very much. Uh, the, the first question I posed, I guess, earlier on in the chat really had to do with um, storage for uh, cycle, well, bicycles, strollers, scooters, other devices are not necessarily micro, micro mobility innovations, but things that have been around for a long time and that families use in particular. And it seems to me that uh, one of the things that holds back even greater adoption in cities like Cambridge or places that have decent bike infrastructure is just lack of uh, covered and safe storage and parking space uh, for things like scooters, bikes, um, prams for parents and things like that that roll on streets. And I wonder what it would take, maybe Yasha can comment on that from a regulatory perspective to actually require that these are part of new developments, just like parking spaces have been for half a century, that apartment buildings ought to have safe and covered um, parking areas for bicycle scooters and so forth, um, and uh, on a regular systemic basis. Yeah, so we do have um, parking, bicycle parking requirements with a one-to-one -one unit ratio uh, for all new developments in the city. Um, indoor, covered, uh, secure bicycle parking. Those are intended for residents. What we have not done is either figured out a on-street secured bike parking solution for neighborhoods where people are in existing buildings and they maybe can't park inside. Uh, we've also not introduced a requirement for visitor parking or, uh, you know, uh, uh, patron parking that is covered and uh, 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 secure. So, you know, we have Tremendous uh, numbers of bike racks that will go in with any new development that happens. Uh, I, I saw somebody posted on what was then Twitter, a photo of a recent building in Boston. There were so many bike racks in front and it was sort of, they kind of memed it as like, you know, the rest of the country wants to know where all the bike racks are. It's like, you know, 40 bike racks in front of this building. So we are really trying to make sure that at least the basics of parking are there. We're interested in some of the experiments that are happening in New York with companies like Onipod and, and some of the others that are looking at more kind of permanent secured off-street parking or, or on-street parking. But uh, to date, we haven't really started exploring that yet, but we're open to it. Excellent. Okay. Um, actually, I'd, I'd like to turn to one of the, I think the, actually the very first question posed was uh, from Amanda Gex. And she, she based, it's a very simple and compelling question. What type of micro mobility models do we actually think are working? Um, especially given some of the headwinds in the in the market. And you know, here I, you know, Bubon, you had your matrix at the beginning. And I was wondering, like, you know, is to, for me at least a fundamental difference in the market is the distinction between shared micromobility and owned vehicles that that we all use and, and operate. So maybe just reflecting on on that distinction, are there any sort of comments from any of the panelists about kind of what what do we envision is really working well? Uh, I will go back to the original intent of uh, all these 
vehicles and, and you know by definition it's called personal transporter vehicles right so they so they are single single person use maybe two person most uh and and they they are meant to be sort of owned and also in some way they are actually a lot more affordable than a car right so uh, no matter you're doing sort of gig work or doing deliveries or even you know uh, kids go to school um i think uh, the ownership model i have to say consumer actually vote by their feet literally um so you know whether it's a form factor of a kick scooter or e-bikes it's something they're actually quite familiar with and so actually sometimes it's part on their wish list christmas is coming so i'm getting a scooter for for, for the kids right things, things like that um so i was saying i would say that uh, least uh, the owner's owned model is proven to work or useful right i think it's a question of how do we encourage more people to do this um i don't know that's just my my personal take on that you, your dream tony is that everybody has a scooter in the in the trunk of their car right uh, more, more than what every, every single person <laughs> passenger should have one yeah Fair enough. And uh, Dave, from your side, any any reflections on the kind of the business models that work? Well, you know, we've seen massive dockless companies like Mobike and Ofo come and go, and 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 I think we've all seen in, in on this call anyway the 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 pictures of mountains of of bicycles being thrown away in in China and other places. Um, I I think the just from my perspective and it, it, the the motivate slash lift uh, model of a a um, organized um, and easily accessible and affordable um, system where vehicles are not just left blocking um, uh, wheelchair ramps and and not being thrown in the uh, the river. Um, I think, um, you know, so a docked or dock light system makes a lot of sense at street level. No, you know, I, I always say um, an ownership e-bike is great until the, the person tries to carry it up a flight of stairs to their apartment. And they are only going to do that once and then they're never going to do that again because it is really hard to do. Um, and so having um, ground level um, access to e-mobility um, is is really something that that's great, and I think um, I think it needs to be I think it needs to be organized and docked um, and um, and affordable. Great. With, with that note, I, it's uh, one o'clock now. I was sorry to to cut in here. First of all, I really want to thank the panel for this conversation and everyone on this. Yeah. Thank you so much also Buwang and John for kind of design and moderating this. Yeah, I have two uh, announcements. The first one is uh, uh, two weeks ago, we had the MIT Mobility Vision Day uh, in person. Uh, so now I'm happy to announce that uh, we actually put everything uh, online uh, with all the recording of the multiple sessions here, right? So welcome everyone with interest to go take a look at it. We'll put in the link into the, into the chat. Uh, it's a very good summary of the, the whole day there. Uh, the second announcement is that uh, next week is a Thanksgiving holiday. We will not have the seminar, right? Particularly for the international audience that uh, it's a special holiday, we will not have the seminar next week, right? But the week after, we do have one on December 1st on the VC Startup Synergy in Transportation. This is a new sub-series in the mobile forum that we organize. Uh, after that, we'll have the special session on Dan Everu's Best Dissertation Award uh, and Presentation. There are one winners, Bertrand Moore, and two or, uh, honorable mentions, uh, Runak and Kartik. Uh, they are really the, represent the best of our the MIT transportation students. So they are going to give a presentation on their, their dissertation research. And last one, in, to conclude this term session, is uh, we on deal with the institutional investment in mobility. Uh, it's another sub-series that organized. We work together with uh, Jeff Shen from BlackRock. With that, uh, goodbye, everybody. Have a great Thanksgiving holidays. See you two weeks from now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.